The Priority of Sacrifice It's time for another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, as she called us to live to a higher standard each day, not to be satisfied with just a little religion. What a shallow substitute for what God wants for our lives. As this series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, friends, and others. They were influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. Today, we continue our look at how to simplify your life. Next week, we'll conclude this series. But today, we have two Gateway to Joy broadcasts for you. Go to God first, and love means sacrifice. Our guests today, Juana Michaels, author and longtime friend of Lars and Elizabeth, and Kathy Gilbert, who will be talking about suffering, Amy Carmichael, and fire words. Well, let's get started with Gateway to Joy 368, Go to God First. There's always that temptation to figure it out on our own, to go ask a neighbor, and maybe later we'll finally get around to seeking the wisdom of the Bible and the Creator. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, continuing my talks today on how to simplify your life. Yesterday, I talked about the givens and the not givens, and what great peace it brings when we realize that God is much wiser than we are, and he knows how to give us exactly what's best for us. My dear friend Dorothy, an old woman who died when she was in her 90s, she was a spinster all her life. She lived on Cape Cod, and I learned so much wisdom from her. And I can just still hear her saying, Well, Betty dear, I believe that God gives us exactly what's right for us. And it was singleness for her all her life. Today, I want to talk about going to God first. Another simplifying principle in your life. When you get a piece of bad news, or somebody says something to you that upsets you, or somebody looks at you funny when you go to church, or any little thing that sets you off balance, what do you do? What is the first thing that you're tempted to do? Pick up the phone and call two or three of your best friends and tell them how awful everything is? Rush off to a counselor? Try to find a book that'll take your mind off this awful thing? How about just going to God first? I want to ask, what ever happened to the wonderful counselor? We're told in Isaiah that God is a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, the Prince of Peace. And today we have thousands, I suppose hundreds of thousands, of professional counselors. I am not saying that you must not go to a professional counselor. Please do not misquote me now. But what I do want to urge you to do is to go to God first. Instead of picking up the phone or dialing and trying to find out how can I get some counseling on this because six of your friends have told you that what you need is some counseling, they may be right what you need is some counseling, but maybe the kind of counseling that you need you can get at the foot of the cross. Chances are pretty good, aren't they? that you could get the counseling you need at the foot of the cross. Probably many of my listeners are not aware that there was any such thing as counseling in the professional sense before this century. There was no such thing. In fact, most of the professional counseling has risen since the 50s. So it's really a very short span of the people who've lived in the world who have had what is called today professional counseling. So I'm here to remind you of the ancient principle of going to God first. In Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16, we read, Since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, 
let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Many of my listeners, I'm sure, do not have access to professional counseling. Perhaps because you can't get there, you don't have a car, you have too many children, you're ill, or for other reasons, and you've learned that there is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, and that place is where the wonderful counselor waits for you. And he says, I will help you. He says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. I am thy God, I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee by the right hand of my righteousness. How many promises do you need? Well, I have to say that I have found such peace and such wisdom when I go simply to the foot of the cross. I'm not saying that I never go to a close friend to talk about some difficulties that I've had. Certainly not. And I go to my husband sometimes with things that are bothering me. And that's perfectly normal, it's perfectly natural, and I'm sure that God ordained it that way. He wants us to have good friends, he wants us to be intimate with our husbands and wives. But when we're really up against it, do you remember that there's a wonderful counselor? Are you tempted to run to a friend or a counselor or a professional? Stop and think about it. Those people have never been tempted in every way. Who has been tempted in every way? Jesus Christ. The Bible says he was tempted in every way, yet without sin. So he knows. He knows exactly what you're going through. The Bible says he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power, we will live with him to serve you. Now, there's a spiritual principle that's tucked away in this go to God first principle. Because when the Lord has dealt with us in our trials and our sorrows and our tribulations, then we are, although we are weak in him, we can live and serve him, and he enables us, he equips us to help and serve other people. And do you know who the people are that have most helped me in my darkest times? Not a one of them has been a person who would run to a professional counselor. Not a one of them was a professional counselor. They were godly people. I thank God for godly parents to start with, and I am greatly blessed in having had that kind. I could go to my mother or my father and ask for their advice, and they gave it. But there have been a long list of people in my life. Would you like me to read the list that I have of women alone who have influenced my life? Catherine Howard was my mother. Betty Scott Stam, whom I never met, but I read her writings, and I read her prayer, Lord, I give up all my own plans and purposes. Dr. Virginia Blakesley, a woman whom I heard speak when I was about 12 or 14 years old, and she's the one who imprinted in my mind indelibly those wonderful words of Isaiah 50, verse 7, the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed." I will never forget the tears pouring down the face of Dr. Blakesley as she articulated those wonderful words from Isaiah 50. I never forgot them, and I use them over and over and over again as I'm doing my housework, as I'm sitting at my desk doing my desk work, as I'm preparing to do Gateway to Joy talks. I say, Lord, help me. Please help me. The Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Well, I got as far as Dr. Virginia Blakesley, then the next one on my list 
was Mrs. DuBose, the headmistress of the school that I went to in Florida, who said to us, do the next thing. Don't go around with the Bible under your arm if you didn't sweep under the bed. Then there was a sweet missionary woman named Carol Canfield, a woman for whom childbearing was a not given. She was married. She and her husband were missionaries for 50 years or so in China. And they used to come, and they were just wonderful sort of surrogate grandparents to us children. I can remember climbing a mountain with the Canfields one time in New Hampshire, one of the women of influence. Then there was Isabel Kuhn. I only heard her speak once. She's the author of many missionary books, but a lovely woman with a very womanly, feminine grace about her. Catherine Cumming, the dorm mother when I was a student at Wheaton College, a dear single woman who poured herself out for us single girls. Then there was Catherine Cunningham, the one that I told you about, who invited me down to her little apartment, the Scottish lady. And there was Catherine Morgan. You see, I've got five Catherines here. Catherine Morgan was a missionary in Bogota, Colombia, and as far as I know now, she is 90 years old, and she is still a missionary. Then there was my colleague, Doreen Clifford, an English lady with whom I worked in the western jungle of Ecuador in my very first year as a missionary. I could go to these people, and it was fruitful to do so, but I challenge you to go to God first. Don't go first to a human counselor. None of them have been tempted in every way. But the Bible tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way, and yet he was without sin. He was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power, we will live with him to serve you. Go to God first. Part 7 of How to Simplify Your Life. This is a 10-part series. Later, we'll hear Gateway to Joy Program 369, Love Means Sacrifice. Juana Michaels, longtime friend of Elizabeth, recalls the time when Elizabeth was happy that Juana was taking to heart what she had learned. And I told her how much that the study she had done on Fruits of the Spirit had pierced my heart. She said she was so glad that I was doing something about what I was learning, that so many people write her and say they just enjoy her or they're inspired, but that she had given me that practical help and I had done something about it. Juana Michaels, friend of Elizabeth. Later on, Kathy Gilbert, researcher and friend of Elizabeth, will have a a few thoughts on Amy Carmichael on fire words and suffering. That coming up later. First, though, how to simplify your life, part eight. Love means sacrifice. We like the first part of that, don't we? The love part, but the sacrifice, and that can be a hard thing to embrace. Is that news to you, that love means sacrifice? It can't be news if you're a father or a mother. Once that baby comes, your life changes, doesn't it? But perhaps you don't even have to think about it as sacrifice because you adore that little package that God has given you, that sweet baby girl or baby boy. But over the years, you begin to realize that that baby child, boy or girl, has the power to rake your soul with pain. Love always means sacrifice. And for you who are anticipating the possibility of marriage, don't forget there will be many ways in which you are going to have to give up your right to yourself. 1 Corinthians 13 is the definitive passage on this principle. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, 
but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. And get this one now, it keeps no record of wrongs. I confess that I am tempted to keep records of wrongs so that rather than just rushing off to somebody and accusing them of having hurt me in some way, I store them up and I think one of these days that person is going to do something so bad that I will be able to read this record of wrongs that I've been keeping in my head. It's wicked. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Why do people's marriages break up? You know what the basic reason is? Because they do not remember that love means sacrifice. Now, you loved that person that you married. At least you thought you did back then. But you hadn't had a whole lot of opportunity to understand that love means sacrifice. And somehow or other, usually within 24 hours after you say, I do, you're going to find out that what you're married to is a sinner. And what do you think that person is married to? You, a sinner too. And so if a sinful man and a sinful woman are going to try to make it happily for 365 days a year, what are they going to have to do? Sacrifice. 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 You give up your right to yourself. It's exactly the same thing as Jesus put right at the beginning when he said, if you want to be my disciple. He said, if you want to be my disciple, you must give up your right to yourself. Are you ready for that? Were you ready for that when you got married? My husband and I were invited to go to a very beautiful, gorgeous wedding. And when we were also invited to go to the reception, they asked specifically that each of us would give a what they called a toast. And by that, they meant a challenge to the bride and groom. When it was my turn, I said to the groom, you married Nina because you loved her. But from this day forward, you must love Nina because you married her. You understand that? Love means sacrifice. In 1 Corinthians 13, we read, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Love never fails. 1 John 3.16 is a corollary to John 3.16. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And in 1 John 3.16, we find the corollary. This is how we know what love is, that Christ laid down his life for us. And we, in our turn, must lay down our lives for each other. Just today in the mail, I received a beautiful card from a group of Hungarians who take care of handicapped people. They enclosed a photograph of all those handicapped inmates, and they themselves were with them. 
and it reminded me of the visit that I made to that lovely place in Hungary and saw the gentleness, the kindness, the sacrifice that was so evident in that home for those dear people. They called them children, but some of them were 40, 50, 60 years old, but all of them were in one way handicapped. And there they sat day after day, some of them picking up with a pin tiny little flakes of eggshells and gluing them in such a way as to make a framed picture. I have a framed picture in my wall made by those dear handicapped people. And I think of how love means sacrifice. It can't possibly be easy to take care of those people day in and day out. And only God knows how difficult it is for the people themselves to have to be taken care of. Some of them can't speak. We can't ask them questions. We don't know what's going on in their heads. We don't know whether that seemingly blank look has anything behind it. And yet they are creatures of God. Love means sacrifice. Jesus said, if you love me, you will do what I command. He didn't say, if you love me, sing about it, talk about it, write poetry about it, think about it, pray about it. He said, if you love me, obey. Do what I say. The only valid test of our love for God is obedience. And husband and wife, what is the problem between the two of you? If there's a problem, it's because you are not prepared to pay attention to the good of the other. Forget about yourself. Be concerned for the good of the other person. And you know what? I don't believe that such a marriage would ever fall apart. Concern for the good of the other person goes along very well with the three conditions of discipleship. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you must give up your right to yourself. That's point one. Lay down your life, surrender, give it all up to Jesus. And point two, take up the cross. Can you imagine that the cross will mean something less than suffering? There will be crosses in every marriage. There will be suffering. There will be opportunities to give up your right to yourself. And the third condition of discipleship is follow. Are you following Jesus Christ or are you following your own sweet way? Are you prepared to think only and exclusively for the good of the other person without ever saying, but what about me? What about my feelings? That's God's business. You leave you and your feelings up to God. Put yourself on the altar. Surrender yourself to him. And start majoring in the good of the other. And you know there may be a dramatic change in your marriage. There was a son who came from a wealthy home. He was pricked to the heart by the Holy Spirit. He was thoroughly changed. He shone like a flame. A man stole his camel eye. A camel eye is an Indian device used in India for the drawing of water. The Christian man said nothing when the man stole that device. The man, perceiving the gentleness of this Christian, demanded the loan of his bulls and his plow. And the Christian said to him, Take not only my bulls and my plow, but take fodder also. That melted the heart of the Indian. He fell at his feet and asked forgiveness. And he was led to Jesus Christ. That's a true story. A story of love, which means sacrifice. Part 8 of How to Simplify Your Life. This is a 10-part series. We'll conclude next week. That was Love Means Sacrifice. Well, Kathy Gilbert, friend of Elizabeth, has some thoughts on suffering, on Amy Carmichael, on Lars, 
and on fire words. This is about two and a half minutes long. Kathy Gilbert. So what are some of the important things people need to know about Elizabeth? I don't think a person can have a prophetic voice like Elizabeth without having suffered. And she did indeed suffer. Her fourth telling of the word of God, it was shockingly supernatural the way her words pierced hearts and minds. And the presence she had, as soon as she would open her mouth, everyone stopped to listen. Not a word was wasted when she would speak. Each was like an arrow from God hitting the center of our hearts. Now there's one thing that she prayed she prayed for fire words, and so she quoted Amy Carmichael when Amy Carmichael prayed the very same thing. And this was Amy Carmichael's prayer. Oh God, my words are cold. Oh, that they were as flames. Thus I did cry, and thus God answered me. Thou shalt have words, but at this cost, thou shalt, thou must first be burnt. And Elizabeth Elliot indeed had fire words, and her fire words came through much suffering. But those fire words set others on fire for Jesus. Now, Elizabeth's life and message on suffering, I think, is central for me personally, and I think that many would just benefit from her. And just knowing, as she would emphasize throughout all her teaching and in her books, suffering is never for nothing. She had a supernatural ability to impart the riches and hope and joy of God that she would show through her life and share through her words and her books. She would show us and share with us God's presence and companionship as he took her first and he takes us through a path of suffering. She deeply lived out and practiced what she preached. I believe one of the great benefits of her marriage to Lars was that it was a crucible or refiner's fire that made her life and message pure gold and her words as fire. She is my hero and she is my friend, and how very grateful I am for ElizabethElliot.org, where you have access to her words, to her books, to her newsletters, to all the resources. There's a wonderful way to get to know her through the ElizabethElliot.org website, and then the Elizabeth Elliot podcast, where you can discover Elizabeth for yourself. May God richly bless you. good friend of Elizabeth, Kathy Gilbert, sharing with us today. Thank you, Kathy. Well, looks as though our time is coming to an end. We hear that music from John Hansen. Let me thank you for letting us come into your life today. At the home, at the office, at, uh, at the jogging track, wherever we found you. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, thanks for uh, coming with us today and for checking out elizabethelliot.org too. A lot there for you. elizabethelliot.org. And if you get a chance, be sure to leave a review sometime of uh, this uh, gathering that we have each week. Thanks. Well, until next time, may God remind you daily that you're loved with an everlasting love and underneath are the everlasting arms. <laughs>